Please be seated. And children in kindergarten through fourth grade who are participating in Kids Point this morning, you all may be dismissed to your classroom. Many of us, no doubt, will pause at least for a moment tomorrow to reflect on the anniversary of Drew Parade, even just a few moments ago, the anniversary of September 11, 2001. Some of you will remember that in more weighty ways than others, those who've served as firefighters or law enforcement or even in the armed forces related to the conflict that began on that day. But I want to put before you a, a question to consider related to September 11. On that day, which gods won? Now, there were false reports of Muslims celebrating that murderous attack. But there's little question that many did celebrate it. There's no question that Osama bin Laden counted it as a great victory for his god. Little question that the terrorists believed that they offered their lives as sacrifices to their god. So on that day, on that day when terrorists killed thousands, including Christians and Jews and atheists, and yes, even other Muslims and worshipers of the God of money, did the God of the Quran defeat the God of the Bible? Which gods won? Today in First Chronicles, we leave the genealogies, almost, there's still a little bit left, and we enter into the story. The first day of this story is a day of defeat. It's the day of the death of a king, day of the death of many of his, from among his armies, a defeat for a nation. In fact, God's people are in fear, such that God's people scatter. The king is dead, the worshipers of idols celebrate. They bring their celebration, their trophies, into the house of their gods. And so the people of Israel well could have asked the question, which god won? Had their god been defeated? And what I want you to remember from this study of First Chronicles, chapter 9, but mostly in verse 10 today, is that the consequences of our unfaithfulness do not lead to the defeat of our God. The consequences of, for our unfaithfulness ultimately reaffirm God's sovereign authority. Our God is not defeated on any day in human history. We may be unfaithful. We may be defeated. We may be set on the run, but the consequences of our unfaithfulness merely provide opportunities for God to reaffirm his sovereign authority. So I want to ask you to look with me at 1 Chronicles chapter 9. We'll begin reading in just a moment in verse 35. This is where we see the, the setting of unfaithfulness. I want to show you four aspects of unfaithfulness in this chapter, or four ways in which Faith, the story of unfaithfulness in the life of a king unfolds, I need to introduce you to the setting here. So look with me, if you would, at chapter 9, verse 35. I won't read all the way to the end of the chapter. You'll get a sense of where we're going pretty quickly. In Gibeon lived the father of Gibeon, Jael, and the name of his wife was Maaka, and his firstborn son Abdon, then Zur, Kish, Baal, Ner, Nadab, Gedor, Ahio, Zechariah, and Mikloth. And Mikloth was the father of Shinnim, and these also lived opposite their kinsmen in Jerusalem with their kinsmen. Ner fathered Kish. Kish fathered Saul. Saul fathered Jonathan, not the Shua, Abinadab, and Deshbal. Now, if over these last three weeks now, you've been reading these, these genealogies really, really closely, all right, as I'm sure we all have been, 
you can tell me what's a little bit odd about what we just read, right? I'm tempted to ask for a raise of hand, but I think I would be embarrassed by that more than you would. This whole section here, verse 35 down to verse 44, is, is almost exactly, almost word for word what we read last week, or at least what we looked over last week in chapter 8. So chapter 8, verses 29 through 38 are reproduced almost word for word here in chapter 9, verses 35 to 44. Why? Okay? Well, chapter 8 was the genealogy of Benjamin. You may remember then that from Benjamin, we leap forward a few hundred years to chapter 9. Chapter 9 of 1 Chronicles, where we concluded the first part, where we concluded last week, records the exiles who come home. They're exiled first in Babylon, then in Persia. They're home now. The Persian king Cyrus has invited them to come home, to rebuild their city, even to rebuild their temple. And so by the end of 2 Chronicles, the people of Israel, those who've come home from exile in, in Persia, they're now, they've now rebuilt their temple and they've started to, to worship the Lord again in that place. And so the chronicler writes to people who know that story. Okay, that, that story of Cyrus, that story of return from exile, rebuilding the temple, they know that story as fairly recent history. So the people who are reading First and Second Chronicles, they're the people who, who can remember, they know people who were there when they came home, when the temple was rebuilt. It was like 100 years or so before, roughly. So if you think uh, for our context, it, it's history that's about like 1900, you know, the first flight of an airplane or World War I, or, you know, a, a Spanish flu epidemic. Things like that that are relatively recent history, but still a, a little ways out. But now, all of a sudden, between, between chapter 9 and chapter 10, the chronicler, chronicler leaps forward, or actually leaps backward, to a place that's not 100 years before the people reading his book, but more like 600 years. Events that happen in chapter 10 are like 600 years prior to these exiles who, who come back home. So if you think for us, that's like 1400, you know, 1400 AD, 100 years before Columbus set sail, right? So more like ancient history. And your Bible may have a heading here at the beginning of chapter 10, the death of Saul, it probably says, or something like that. So what we see is that this genealogy at the very end of chapter 9 leads us into the story. It's the genealogy of Saul leading us to Israel's first king. And when it introduces us to Israel's first king, when it introduces us to Saul, it introduces us to this first king in his last chapter, in fact, his very last day. So you may remember, those of you who've been around here for a couple of years, you may remember when Drew preached through 1 Samuel in the beginning of 2 Samuel. In 1 Samuel, Saul is like the lead character, the main actor from you know, for, for 24 chapters. Here in First Chronicles, he doesn't get 24 chapters. He doesn't even get 24 verses. He gets 14 verses, 10, 1 through 14. He's now, Saul, just like an aging warm-up act for the headliner. We also have Chronicles pointing us to another king, who we'll see at the very end of our story today. So the chronicler assumes we know a lot about the story of Saul, right? Because he only gives us a vision into Saul's last day of life. You may remember also from 1 Samuel that the people of Israel came to the prophet Samuel who judged the people of Israel, and, and they're disappointed with his leadership. They don't trust his sons who were likely to, they, they, they expected likely to succeed him. And Samuel's, Samuel's really old. They don't like the way their, their nation is heading. But the people also want to be like the other nations. That's back there in 1 Samuel. They wanted a king like the other nations. They wanted a king who would lead them into battle against their enemies, a king they could rally around, someone who would fight for them. And so when they come to Samuel and say, hey, Samuel, we want a king, Samuel is hurt. He takes it as a personal rejection. And so he talks to the Lord. And the Lord speaks to Samuel and says, Samuel, they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. It's as if the Lord says to Samuel, Samuel, they are just doing, the people of Israel are just doing to you the same thing they've been doing to me since the day I led them out of Egypt. They've been rejecting me day after day after day, all through the wilderness. I mean, even in unbelief, as I'm leading them, as I'm about to lead them through the Red Sea, 
unbelief while Moses was on the mountain, at Mount Sinai, with the Lord. The people are down at the foot of the mountain rejecting him, setting up an idol. And that's just the beginning of the story. Well, now Israel has their king. It's Saul. Saul has fought for them. Saul has won some major battles, again, that we read about in 1 Samuel. But Saul has also squandered opportunities. His son Jonathan saves him from the, from the foolish decisions that he would have made. But his son Jonathan can't save him from all of his foolish decisions. Saul is not the king that they need. So with these returned exiles, with the people living 600 years after Saul, what they need to know about Saul and everything that they need to know about Saul is right here, right here in chapter 10. They need to see a picture of an unfaithful king. This is the, the setting for unfaithfulness. But then in chapter 10, we are introduced to the outcome of Saul's unfaithfulness. I keep using this word unfaithfulness. You're not going to see it yet. We'll get there. I'm kind of giving away the point of the sermon before the punchline at the end. You will see that Saul is an unfaithful king, and everything that happens to him and to the nation is a result of his unfaithfulness. But here in verses 10, to 10 in chapter 10, verses 1 through 7, we'll find the outcome of his unfaithfulness. Now the Philistines fought against Israel. So again, one of Israel's major opponents, one of the ones that Saul had gained victory over. And the men of Israel fought, fled before the Philistines and fell slain on Mount Gilboa. And the Philistines overtook Saul and his sons. And the Philistines struck down Jonathan and Abinadab and Malkishua, the sons of Saul. The battle pressed hard against Saul, and the archers found him. And he was wounded by the archers. Then Saul said to his armor bearer, Draw your sword and thrust me through with it, lest these uncircumcised come and mistreat me. But his armor bearer would not, for he feared greatly. Therefore Saul took his own sword. And fell upon it. And when his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he also fell upon his sword and died. Thus Saul died. He and his three sons and all his house died together. And when all the men of Israel who were in the valley saw that the army had fled and that Saul and his sons were dead, they abandoned their cities and fled. And the Philistines came and lived in them. This is the outcome of unfaithfulness, the king that Israel wanted, the king that Israel wanted for the very purpose of leading them into victory, this very king ends his life leading them in a great defeat. And the most shameful kind of defeat. He flees, his sons are dead, it's not the end of his physical line, there's one son that survives, but, his, but it is the end of his kingly line. He's trapped by Philistine archers, he's wounded, Capture is inevitable, and Saul seems to know how the Philistines are capable of torturing, abusing, misusing their captives. He'd rather die than face that, so he tries to convince his own armor bearer to end his life. And when that fails, Saul takes it himself. Now, while this is not the primary point of the passage, I think we can't encounter one of the major suicides of the Bible without discussing this topic a bit because many of us have known and loved people who have taken their own lives. And we've perhaps had questions about them, about the Lord's faithfulness, about the gospel, about their eternal state. I want to say at the outset, I'm, I'm not sure this is the best passage from which to ground our understanding of the ethics of suicide. Ordinarily, let me be clear, ordinarily, suicide rejects God's word. You shall not murder. That includes yourself. You're violating God's command to commit suicide, every bit as much as you would be to kill another person. We do not possess authority from God to take even our own lives, except in the case, as in Genesis 9, where God authorizes capital punishment executed by the state, not by one individual vengeance seeker. But what if, as in this case, what if you're facing inevitable death by torture? What then? Well, it's important to realize that Saul landed in this predicament because of his own choices, right? He didn't get here as a result of a series of unfortunate events. This is a direct result of choices that he's made that are accounted for, that are recorded in 1 Samuel. 
That's one reason this passage isn't the, you know, the ideal, doesn't give, offer us the ideal case study for a, a, a textbook on ethics. Friends, let me be clear. Suicide rejects God's word. It is the final rejection of God's plan for our lives. But at the same time, the Bible never teaches that it is an unpardonable sin. There are those who say that individuals who, who commit suicide immediately go under God's judgment. You will find no justification for that argument anywhere in Scripture. The Bible teaches no such thing. Those who die, by even by their own hand, who have fixed their hopes in the work of Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ for them, are in, receive a place, receive the grace of God in a place in eternity alongside us. But if, so if Saul is in hell today, it is not for the sin of suicide. If Saul is in hell today, it is for unbelief, as we'll see play out through this play out throughout this passage. And I want to say, my friend, if you feel an impulse to harm yourself, if you've been tempted, if you feel like there's no way out, like you're in a trap, like you are caught, like you are at such a place of shame and defeat and hopelessness that suicide is the only escape for you, you your heart is speaking lies to yourself. There are dozens of brothers and sisters in this room who want to help walk through that situation with you. You will not encounter greater happiness by taking your own life. In fact, you will only bring greater grief and sadness to those who deep down in your heart you know that you're wrong. Suicide solves no problems. Friends, the gospel is true for you regardless of the circumstances you found yourself in whether it's even by your own fault that you found yourself in. You are not like Saul. God hasn't rejected you. You are not hopeless. You are not cursed. The power of the gospel of Jesus Christ to provide hope and resurrection and eternal life is true for you. As I said, it's Saul's sin that has put him in this situation, and that sin has consequences. Consequences, as we can see here for himself, Consequences for his armor bearer who follows him in suicide. Perhaps he says he was afraid. Perhaps he fears retribution if he lives and Saul does not. Consequences for Saul's sons. In fact, for all the men of Israel who fall slain. Look there, verse 7. Consequences, even those who, who live in the valley, who flee their homes, realizing that there, there's no longer anyone there to protect them from the Philistines. God made promises to Abraham long before to give his people this land. It would be theirs for an everlasting possession. And now Saul, as a result of his unbelief, his unfaithfulness, the last day of this king puts that promise from God in doubt. It causes people of Israel to whom God had promised that land to feel as if they had nowhere else to go but to receive it. The land that had been gained is now being surrendered. Saul and his sons are dead. They run this may be a rational, people, a rational decision for the people of the valley to flee. Maybe they have no choice at this moment. Maybe they're left with no choice before the advancing Philistines. But just like Saul, the people of the nation of Israel, they made a choice long before. They wanted to be like the other nations. They wanted to fix their hopes on a king who would fight their battles. Who fought Israel's battles before their kings? God did. I mean, read through the book of Joshua. One time after another, it's not the might of the kings. In the book of Judges, it's not the power of the judges. It is the Holy Spirit of God falling upon God's people or hailstones from heaven falling upon their enemies that achieves their goal. But now Israel looks to a man, and their destiny now rises and falls with their leader, not with their Lord. So Scripture asks us, once again, it does this all the time, doesn't it? You hear this in my preaching. Scripture asks, asks us to consider where have we placed our trust? On whom are you and I fixing our trust on this day, in this year, in this age of our experience? Of our experience? Who are you and I trusting? Who do we think will fight and win our battle? year, we have fixed our hopes in the wrong places. We've taken our eyes down from heaven 
and look horizontally. People we can depend upon, whether they be pastors or politicians. Fix your hopes not on them or us, but on the Lord and him alone. This is the outcome of unfaithfulness. But then in verses 8 through 12, we see the shameful effects of unfaithfulness. And we pick up reading there in verse 8. The next day when the Philistines came to strip the slain, they found Saul and his sons fallen on, on Mount Gilboa. And they stripped him and took his head and his armor and sent messengers throughout the land of the Philistines to carry the good news to their idols and to the people. And they put his armor in the tent of their gods and fastened his head in the temple of Dagon. But when all Jabesh Gilead heard all that the Philistines had done to Saul, all the valiant men arose and took away the body of Saul and the bodies of his sons and brought them to Jabesh. And they buried their bones under the oak in Jabesh and fasted seven days. Well, when we re read this passage, we can see why Paul or why Saul didn't want to be taken alive. The Philistines decapitate his corpse and desecrate it. What would they have done to him if they had captured him while he still took breath? His head becomes their trophy, fastened to the wall of their God. His armor, perhaps the same offer, armor that he offered to David when David was about to go fight Goliath. His armor becomes the very symbol of his defeat. Friends, see here, because of, of, of Saul's unfaithfulness, the Philistines celebrate. Saul, this conquering king, becomes a mere pawn in their idol worship. Saul's failure, the, the, the plot line of his life, recurring failure and unbelief and unfaithfulness, Saul's failure lets the Philistines pretend that their God has defeated Yahweh. Saul and his death gives his enemies, the enemies of God, an opportunity to celebrate their idol worship. But brothers and sisters, have we considered how our unfaithfulness justifies idol worship? Have we considered how we give others the occasion to celebrate their gods? I mean, think of all the times when non-Christians make true accusations that we are hypocrites when we profess one thing and live another way contrary to it. Or when we live for the same gods the world does, just maybe a little bit less, right? So we can pretend like we're different. So we can pretend like we're better than them. When we worship the world's gods, we add another stone to their idol temples. We build up the house of their idols. When we live, whether it be money, influence, power, love, affection, whatever it may be, when we live for the same gods the world does. Now, there is some good news here. This is the fun part to preach. It's not just Saul who is shamed in this passage. Did you catch that? This account, this little chunk, verses 8 through 12, actually exposes the folly of the Philistine gods on their best day. On the best day of the Philistine gods, their foolishness is on full display. And I'm pretty sure the chronicler sets it up this way to mock them. Did you see that there? Look at verse 9. What do the Philistines do? They carry the good news to their idols. Their idols are so stupid that they have to hear the good news of their victory from the people that won the battle. You see that? It's as if they're, they're good, good news. In the, in the New Testament, we call that evangelism, declaring the good news is evangelism. The gospel is good news. It's as if these Philistines have to go back and evangelize their own gods. How ridiculous is that? Friends, understand this. You don't carry good news to your God. Our God is the source of good news. He is the orchestrator of good news. He is the one who offers, to, he's the one who creates the good news. Understand this. He is the one who makes good news happen. You know, when we pray, when we praise God for someone who's declared faith in Jesus Christ, when we celebrate a baptism, that's not news to our God. 
He is the one who caused that day to be. I mean, understand, throughout the scriptures, our God is the orchestrator of good news, even on bad days. Your God reigned on the day that he created the heavens and the earth, and he also reigned on the day when Adam fell into sin. Your God reigned when the people of Israel when were enslaved by Egypt. God reigned. On the, in the same way, God reigned when he brought them out of Egypt. God reigned when they sinned in the wilderness. God reigned when they conquered Canaan throughout the book of Joshua. God reigned on this day when the Philistines won their victory over the people of Israel. When their king is dead, when the Philistines chased them out of the land God had promised. And God, God reigns when under King David they take that land back and build a temple there for the worship of their God under King Solomon. God reigned. God reigned just as he did on every day. He reigned on the day when the leaders of Israel uh, plotted Jesus' death. They reign, God reigns as Jesus hangs on the cross. God reigns every day that there is a natural calamity or a mass shooting or, or a bad election or an evil court decision or an, or an unjust action performed against you or an unjust action performed by you. On each and every one of those days, our God reigns. His authority is not teetering on any of those days. We have good news from heaven. And the good news that we have from heaven is that God reigns. God reigns as a righteous just, a righteous judge and as a merciful God who sends a Savior to gather people to him. The good news from heaven is that God reigns and Jesus saves. Jesus reigns, the one who conquered Satan when he overcame temptation in the wilderness. Jesus reigned when he conquered Satan through his suffering for us. Jesus reigned when he conquered Satan, when he rose from the grave, and every day since, until this day. Every day simply adds one more day to Jesus' undefeated streak for us. That is good news. That is good news from God that you need to believe regardless of what this day holds or what the next day holds. Did you know there are Christians in Morocco? I assume that there were Christians who were killed in Morocco yesterday. Their God reigned yesterday. Their God reigns today. Even as, no doubt, some joined him in his presence. This is the message for you to believe. Regardless of what the present or the future holds, our God reigns. Now in this story, the only human heroes are the men we meet in verses 11 and 12. The men of Jabesh Gilead. This backstory is in 1 Samuel as well. Years before, Saul rescued the men of Jabesh Gilead from the Ammonites who were threatening them. This is the Saul's first victory. It's how he consolidated his authority, how he really became king when he saved the men of Jabesh Gilead. Now they return the favor on the day of his death. They rescue his body from further shame. We read there in verse 12, I think it is, that they fasted for seven days after rescuing and burying his body. While the law of Moses required cleansing rituals, even a seven-day period of, of cleansing after touching the dead body, there's nowhere that I can find in the Old Testament law that required seven days of fasting after touching a dead body. So I take this to be an act of worship by the men of Gil Jabesh Gilead. It's their profession that this God who has is, who is allowed suffering to come upon the house of Saul death and defeat to come upon the nation of Israel, this is still a God who is worthy of being worshipped. Even in this time of mourning and defeat and grief. Brothers and sisters, understand this, all right? As we say that our God reigns, know that God's faithful people, those who trust him, we can worship him even in times of grief and defeat because that is not the last day. That is not God's last word on our circumstances. So my brothers and sisters, when you feel discouraged and defeated and overwhelmed, whether because of your own sin or because of what seem like random circumstances or because of oppressive acts committed against you, whatever the reason behind it may be, what will it take for you to worship him? As you feel defeated and discouraged and overwhelmed and hopeless, what will it take 
What will it take for you, for me to worship on that day? It will take trust, right? It will take a confident expectation that God has not stepped off his throne. He, he has not abdicated his throne on that day. That your suffering is not a result of God's limited power, his ceasing to care for you. What it takes for you to worship on a day like that is a confidence that his purposes are unfolding in a way different from the story you would have written on a timetable that's not the one that you would prefer. But by the time you see the end of the story, you will see that his purposes were good. The end is sweet. And that's the end of the narrative. That's all there is to this story. There are still two more verses we need to consider. But they don't tell the story. It's all story is done. Those last two verses merely explain it. Remember the, the three tools I've talked about the last couple of weeks? These last two verses, verses 13 and 14, they're that third tool. Look in the narrative passages, the story passages, for the words from someone who knows the meaning of the story and, and gives us an explanation of the story, kind of a divinely inspired commentary, a color commentary, right, on the, on the events that have unfolded. And so it's here in verses 13 and 14 that we find divine commentary on unfaithfulness. What you'll see here in these two verses is really the three answers to three questions. Why does Saul die? Who killed him? Maybe not the question you'd expect. And then what happens next? Is this the end of the story of God and his people Israel? Let's look at chapter 10, verses 13 and 14. So Saul died for his breach of faith. He broke faith with the Lord in that he did not keep the command of the Lord and also consulted a medium seeking guidance. He did not seek guidance from the Lord. Therefore, the Lord put him to death and turned the kingdom over to David, the son of Jesse. I told you this passage, these last two verses raised three questions. The first is, why did he die? Well, the answer is right there in verse 13. Saul died. For his breach of faith. Other translations, you may see that he trespassed God's command. The word there, the underlying Hebrew word, means that Saul was unfaithful. He had committed infidelity against his God. Spiritual adultery is essentially what it is. Two ways he did this. First of all, he didn't keep the command of the Lord. See that there in verse 1? How did, Paul, how did Saul not keep the command of the Lord? The author of Chronicles doesn't tell us here. It probably refers to two incidents. There's two specific incidents in 1 Samuel where Saul specifically disobeyed God. The first occasion, Saul was ready to make war. It was a war that God had authorized. God's blessing was upon this war. He was going to get the victory. And Saul wanted to sacrifice to the Lord. Saul actually wanted to worship, it seems, as he was about to lead troops into battle. That's a good thing, right, that he wanted to offer sacrifices to the Lord? Except that Samuel, the prophet, Samuel who had anointed Saul, King Samuel told Saul to wait. He told Samuel, when, he told Saul when he would arrive, I'll arrive on a certain day and I will offer the sacrifice. That day comes. The war's not over yet. That day comes and Saul is impatient. He goes ahead before Samuel shows up and offers the sacrifices himself, disobeying the word of the Lord that had come to him. Through Samuel. And what happens as soon as Saul offers the sacrifices? Samuel shows up. And Saul's unbelief, his disobedience against God's command is exposed. But then there's a second occasion where God had commanded Saul. God said, annihilate the Amalekites. Okay, kill everything. But Saul kept back some of the spoils, some of the animals. He said it was to offer sacrifices, and maybe it was, and maybe he just wanted to enrich himself. He also kept their king alive. It's easy to imagine why he wanted to, would have wanted to keep this king alive sort of as, as his own trophy, even as his corpse becomes a trophy for the Philistines later on. And then just before the battle in this chapter, just before the battle in this chapter, Saul was disturbed that God had gone silent. Saul has established by this point a pattern of, of rebellion, a pattern of unbelief, a pattern of disregarding God's word. So when Saul cries out in the moment, wanting, wanting to hear from the Lord about what he should do. God has gone silent. There's no word from the 
Samuel's den. Saul cries out and doesn't get the word he wanted from the Lord in the timetable he wanted. He goes to a medium, a necromancer, someone who spoke with the dead or at least was able to put on a show as if she was able to speak to the dead, sort of an ancient sort of seance. Saul slips away under cover of night to consult with a medium, someone who would, he hoped, be able to get him to speak to Samuel, from whom he would get a word from the Lord. Saul would rather run to a necromancer than repent and wait on the Lord. What's the root problem here? Saul didn't believe God. What does he trust instead? He trusts his own heart. He trusts his own instincts. He listens to the voice inside him and counts it as wisdom. And it leads to to disaster. It produces ruin. In fact, 1 Samuel chapter 15 gives us commentary on Saul's second occasion of unbelief. Samuel speaks to Saul and, and shows him how his disobedience springs from the soil of his heart. And what's in his heart? A heart full of idolatry. Saul, Samuel speaks to Saul the word of the Lord. Rebellion is as the sin of div- divination. Some of our translations will say witchcraft. And presumption, presuming to act upon your own authority rather than God's, presumption is like iniquity and idolatry. Friends, do you understand what that means? That means that when we listen to our hearts and trust our hearts and follow our hearts rather than submitting ourselves to the authority of God's word, it's just like you're practicing sorcery and witchcraft. It's just like you're walking into the temple of idols and bringing a sacrifice before that piece of stone and falling down before it and praying to that false idol. Our unbelief is like idolatry, and it's demonstrated in everyday sin. It's no different. Our rebellion, our follow, following our own hearts is just a modern modern day way of making ancient idolatry look smart. It's psychobabble that we attach to idolatry. So I ask, friends, whose voices are you listening to? Saul didn't seek guidance from the voice of God, verses 13 and 14 tell us. Where are we seeking guidance? You can probably guess where I'm going. Genesis chapter 3, right? We've been there how many times already this morning to Genesis 3 where the serpent speaks to the woman, and what does he offer her? We saw, we saw at the end of Romans, it's like flattery, right? Telling her what she wants to hear, the smooth voices. You can be like God, knowing good and evil. Trust your eyes. The fruit looks good. It's, it's good for you. Don't you see that? Eve, go ahead and take it. And the serpent deceives her. And she listens to the voice of the serpent. Friends, today the voice of the serpent may come to us through financial advisors or podcasters or news commentators, a website or or a YouTube channel with secrets about conspiracy theories. Friends, are we listening to the voice of the serpent or the voice of God? You know, it can even come to you in the voice of the preacher, which is why you need to make sure that what the preacher's saying is coming from the Bible, not from his own heart. Now, you should note, when Saul consults the medium, and speaks to Samuel through her. He stumbled across some true information, didn't he? Okay, he found he found the truth that he and his sons would die that day. And so you may get you may get true information from your news sources, from the YouTube channel, or the financial advisor, or the, the news commentator. They may give you true information, but guidance, what you should do about the facts of the of the situation in front of us, what you should do about it doesn't come from them, it comes from God. God that we can trust. You let them be your guide. You are guilty of unbelief just like Saul was. We're breaking faith, and we deserve, like Saul did, the death penalty. In the garden of Saul for this very reason. Why why did Saul die? He died because of his unbelief, because of his spiritual infidelity. He didn't trust God. He trusted himself. And by trusting himself, he rebelled against God. But who killed Saul? It seems like an obvious question, doesn't it? 
tried to get the armor bearer to kill him. Wouldn't do it. So he fell on his own sword. He killed him. Maybe we could even say the Philistines killed him, right? He was already wounded. He was certain to die by the Philistines. That's not what the Bible says, is it? Look back there at verse 14. Latter part of the verse. Therefore the Lord put him to death. You see, the Lord is orchestrating all of this. The Lord is orchestrating Saul's doom because he broke faith. The Philistines have not won this battle. Their gods are not superior to Saul's gods. Saul's God. Saul's own God has ended the war. And what happens next? The Lord turned the kingdom over to David son of Jesse. This is the fourth time now we've seen someone break faith, act in unbelief in the book of Chronicles. Came up three times in the genealogies, didn't it? Remember that? It was Achan first. He broke faith. Then it was Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh that, that whored after other idols, broke faith, carried away into captivity. And then it was all Israel at the beginning of chapter 9 that breaks faith And the entire nation is taken away into idolatry. But each one of those times, God has good plans, a return from exile, right? He has a plan for the rise of the priests, the rise of a good line of kings. And here we see that that God is about to introduce to us the person of David, sort of not perfect, but the ideal king for the people of Israel. Every time, every time someone breaks faith, whether it's Achan or the tribes of Israel, or now Saul, all Israel, God reasserts his authority and he reaffirms his grace. He, he reveals one little bit at a time his good plans for his people. So, brothers and sisters, as you look around and observe the story of this world, the story of humanity, the story of our culture, the story of our hearts, Learn to interpret it from God's perspective. That whatever you can see, whatever you can see with your eyes, there's more underneath. There's more happening behind the scenes, orchestrated by the God of heaven, who is accomplishing his purposes even on the very worst of our days. Believe that when the very worst of your days arrives. You see, when we break faith, our God remains faithful. When we lose control of our circumstances, our God remains every bit as sovereign as he has always been. We, in a moment of weakness, when we fall into idolatry, in that same moment, our God exposes the weaknesses of those idols. And in contrast, the omnipotence of his power, the effulgence of his glory. And and, and when we are defeated and when we retreat, when we're on the run, our God has not moved one centimeter. He remains on the throne, ruling with absolute authority and power over all things. Let us pray. Father, we confess our sin of unbelief, our sin of unbelief that shows itself in following our heart, in trusting the the whisper of Satan in our ear. Father, far too often we, we look like children of Saul. So we confess our sin and seek once again your mercy. Guide us, Lord. Help us not to become so hardened that you cease speaking to us. Grant us the gift to hear your voice, to speak your words to ourselves and to one another. Have mercy upon us, we pray in Jesus' name.